So I'm here with Charlotte Nichols, the MP for Warrington North. Charlotte, how's it going? How's your conference been so far? It's been really good. It's impeccably good vibes this year. I wasn't here last year, but I've been coming for a good 15 years. And yeah, the, the vibe, the tenor, the tone, immaculate. <laughs> what have you been looking out for? What are your priorities whilst you're here over the next few days? So some of the key things that I'm here talking at conference about are to do with how we reach net zero, it's to do with sensible drugs policy reform and about dealing with the mental health crisis. So there's all sorts of fringes and events around those issues that I've been sort of madly dashing backwards and forwards between. It's keeping me out of trouble, but yeah, it's uh, lots going on here. In terms of the shape of policy we've heard so far, what's given you hope? What have you been excited to hear about? I think the really interesting thing so far have been what Ed Miliband has announced around energy security and a much more sensible approach from Labour versus what we've seen over the last decade or so about making sure that we've got something that is secure, that people can feel comfortable investing in and that helps us actually reach net zero, which is of course the biggest crisis facing the world at the moment. What do you want to hear more from? I mean, they, a big narrative seems to be that Labour are a little bit timid in a lot of ways. What are you hoping to get on the front foot about and be a little bit less timid on, aside from just the environmental policies? Um, well, one of the things that I'm speaking about at conference this year is with the Centre for Evidence-Based Drugs Policy. We're talking about how to move from a system that's held within the Home Office in terms of departmental responsibility to something that sits as it should within health. So when you look both at things like prescribing of cannabis-based medicines for kids with intractable epilepsy, when you look at things like psilocybin and how that can be used for dealing with various mental health conditions, something that Australia are now doing and the US are expected to approve next year. Having conversations around that, around harm reduction and how we can have a policy that's something that is actually not just sensible but compassionate, evidence-based and based on public health as opposed to the war on drugs that's been a 50-year failure. You spoke about the vibes being very immaculate here so far. Has there been any sort of friction at all that you've sensed on though? Are there some moments of split that we're seeing a little bit? Um, less so in terms of the kind of party generally. Um, I mean, I've been sort of seeding little bits of discontent. I was very pleased with myself today for uh, in the lobby versus MPs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been needlessly competitive there um you know there's discussions about how you balance different competing priorities that are happening so you know i've had some very interesting conversations with you know the rspb and others around how you balance biodiversity and greening our energy systems you know it's not like it's this kind of manufactured um you know everyone's getting on and you can't have any disagreement or dissent about what's happening but I think it's being done in a way that is collegiate and is about trying to form some form of consensus and something that is credible as we are hopefully building towards a general election and a Labour government that can start tackling some of these issues properly. There's a lot of businesses here and it does feel a little bit corporate to me to some extent. Is that a worry to you at all? I think it's actually um, vote of confidence really within what Labour's prospects are considered to be as we head towards that general election. I'm on the Business and Trade Committee or the Bayes Committee as well, has been on it for a number of years and I must have had about 600 requests for meetings with various businesses over this party conference. Now clearly that's not happening, it's you know three days, I'm only one person, there are only so many hours in a day. But I think that there is a real keenness from business to engage with the Labour Party because there is a sense that Labour will be the next party of government and people want to be in front of ministers, in front of decision makers about how we can have an industrial strategy, which we've been lacking for the last two years since the government abolished it, but also something that we can have, you know, growth, we can have more jobs but also good jobs there's been a lot of discussions around how you tie in the growth message with um sort of better business with the work that angela rayner and justin madders are doing about the future of work and employment rights it's something that i think all of us want to be 
partners and stakeholders in and there's no reason why business can't or shouldn't be part of that conversation. What did you think to what Angelina had to say on Sunday? I have not heard Angelina's speech yet. I'm, <laughs> I'm like so ridiculously overbooked with fringe events and stuff that I feel like I'm a kind of a day or so behind on catching up with speeches. Um, but you know, going from what she said previously on this and as I said, you know, Justin Matters who's been working on this with her as part of that team, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about those messages about how we can grow our economy, get more jobs, but have those jobs be something that isn't this kind of uberfication, zero hours contracts, gig economy, something that's actually about looking at particularly some of the sectors like security, cleaning, social care, that's really based on these kind of outsourced, privatised models how we can actually be driving standards up in those sectors rather than a kind of constant downward pressure on wages where the national minimum wage has become not a wage floor but a wage ceiling. Looking at the prospect of if Labour were to get into government that obviously means we'd have Prime Minister Keir Starmer. He's speaking on Tuesday. What are you hoping he'll have to say? I'm hoping that I'm one of the things that again we've been missing over the last number of years is and I don't mean the Labour Party I mean the kind of political arena generally it's a real overarching vision it's not enough to say that you're doing certain things without having a narrative of why what it is that we're trying to build towards and how this is getting us there there is obviously going to be an incredibly difficult economic set of circumstances that Labour will inherit if we do get into government and a lot of structural problems in all sorts of areas not least things like grid connectivity and so on that are going to be huge problems when it comes to making the scale of change in the kind of time frames that we would want to see if we're ambitious but it's about you know what are we trying to do what are our objectives and setting out those missions for government because I think people can understand if you can't do all of these things on day one but people need to know what it is that we're working towards and what that vision is and I'm hoping that's something that he'll lay out. With HS2 having been cancelled and you being so near to Manchester, I'm sure you're going to have a bit of a, an idea, a take on that, let's say. How do you feel that the North is being approached? We always talk about the, the North as if it's one big place, which I know it's not, but the getting out of the Westminster bubble, how do you feel Labour is approaching those sort of constituencies, constituencies like your own, and will handle issues which maybe have been formed by the Conservative government like cancelling HS2? Yeah, I mean, you know, the HS2 one is interesting because, you know, clearly I'd like to see a commitment from Labour that not only would we be committed to it, but also National Powerhouse, uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail, sorry. Um, but it's going to be really difficult for Labour to do that based on when the election is and how much the Conservative Party kind of you know not just scorch the earth but salt the ground afterwards by you know selling land that's meant to be for HS2 to be built on and so on um, I think when we look at the government's new um, sort of northern network that they set out I mean I don't know on what planet places like Plymouth are in the north um, but clearly there's a lot of funding that is being diverted that was expected to be spent between Birmingham and Manchester that's now getting spent in Felixstowe in Bristol in places like that um, I'm really keen to see from Labour a real kind of strategy for how the North is not going to be asked to choose between two things and still end up with neither going forward, which has been a feature of the last 13 years, unfortunately. Now, a little bit of a thought experiment. Imagine I'm an undecided voter. I don't know which way to go. What would you say to me in terms of why I should vote for Labour at the next general election? Well, I don't think it's enough for people to vote Labour just based on what we're not. And it's very easy to ask people and say, you know, what in your life is working better than 13 years ago? But I think this is why that message of vision from this conference is going to be so important because we need to spell out to people not just what we're not, but who we are and what we're planning to do. Um, and I think I'm hopeful that a lot of the things that are getting discussed both in the fringes and on conference floor is going to help us really sell that overarching vision to people rather than just talking about individual bits and pieces of policy and you know, individual initiatives and so on. 
Charlotte, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.